land squeeze. One of the biggest issues in regenerative farming is access to land. Why is that? Farmers in the global industrialized north are aging and many don't have a next generation taking over the farm because of many of the issues of the current farming system. Many other people would love to farm and in many cases are able, but they can never finance the land purchases because land prices and value are completely disconnected. They face competition from ever larger industrialized, extractive, very well financed farms. In many places, over 70% of the farming land is controlled by 1% of the farms. This is just one of the many challenges the latest Land Squeeze report of IPA's Food Panel addresses. We talk about it and the results and what to do about it with one of the experts on the IPA's Food Panel, a small-scale farmer from Canada and a lifelong activist. This is the Investing in Regenerative Agriculture and Food podcast, Investing as if the Planet Mattered where we talk to the pioneers in the regenerative food and agriculture space to learn more on how to put our money to work to regenerate soil, people, local communities and ecosystems while making an appropriate and fair return. Why my focus on soil and regeneration? Because so many of the pressing issues we face today have their roots in how we treat our land and our sea, grow our food, what we eat, wear and consume. And it's time that we as investors, big and small, and consumers start paying much more attention to the dirt slash soil underneath our feet. To make it easy for fans to support our work, we launched our membership community. And so many of you have joined us as a member. Thank you. If our work created value for you, and if you have the means, and only if you have the means, consider joining us. Find out more on gumroad.com slash investing in Regen Ag. That is gumroad.com slash investing in Regen Ag. Or find the link below. Welcome to another episode. Today with organic farmer and long time small farm activist in Canada and globally, one of the co-founders of Via Campesina and part of the IPES Food Panel and co-author of the Lent Squeeze Report, which I will make sure to link below. Welcome, Nettie. Thank you for having me. And you're calling straight from a farm, which I will definitely start unpacking where you are, what you see, what you farm, etc. But to give a bit of background, we always like to start with a personal question. How come you spend most of your awake hours thinking about food and agriculture, thinking about soil, working in the soil, and also writing about the soil? How, how did your life path lead to what you do today? I have grown up on a farm. I have missed in my many decades of life very few harvests. Uh, I grew up on a prairie farm here in Saskatchewan, Canada, and have always been close to, and I might say love, the soil I walk on. And uh, when we get further into our conversation, I'm going to persuade, try to persuade you and everyone who is listening that all of us should pay attention to where we live and uh, the web of life in which we're embedded and the food we eat on in uh, in our daily lives, and that's been my uh, location, I guess. And and to give a bit of context, where is that? What do you farm? How big or how small? Of course, that depends on the context. But just for us to visually feel a bit where you're calling in from today. I'm uh, in, as I said, Saskatchewan, fa- uh, Canada, and it's uh, uh, what was a medium-scale family farm until relatively recently, but because of the huge concentration of land that's going on here and elsewhere, we're now rated as a small-scale farm in the prairie context. And that might surprise you and your listeners because we farm about uh, 2,000 acres, 2,500 acres, which means about a thousand hectares, half of which is farmland. So in many parts of the world, that would seem like a big farm. Wow. But here in the prairies, that's now rated as a small farm. We grow grains and uh, and pulse crops. Uh, let me be a little clearer there. We grow lentils, field peas, wheat, some years barley, no barley this year, and oats. So those are our field crops. And until very recently, we had a small organic cow-calf operation. So we sold 
uh, organic beef. Um, so that's the context here. And let me just say about my current context is that we have had uh, th for the last seven years extremely dry conditions. And thank goodness, this spring it's rained on us. So when I'm looking out of my window now, I see not dry grass and uh, suffering trees around the yard, but I actually see flowers, green grass, and, uh, and healthy trees. And that's a huge gift. We live in a part of the world where the winters are long and cold, and uh, the summers are short, and sometimes, as I noted, way too dry and quite hot. So it's in some ways quite a, a difficult place to grow food in, but we grow a lot of food in this region of the world. And, and what made you decide not to um, integrate the cattle or not to do the cattle anymore? Was that a um, time or was it the context or, or what made you do it's that? the Is time that of, recently okay yeah no it's the time i love cattle and uh, i grew up on a dairy farm and we grew as i said we raised beef cattle here uh, and i think cattle are an important part in this part of the world an important part of the ecosystems but um we are uh, my husband and i are uh, are quite senior and uh, our uh, son has come in to farm with us and he wants to do grain cleaning uh, which he's he's setting up a plant and uh, our purpose is to try to get as close to uh, the consumer to shorten the food chains if you will and uh, what he's uh, interested in doing rather than raising cattle is cleaning our own wheat to food standard and he has already marketed quite a bit of wheat directly to flour mills in uh, in the prairie region and in BC that's a, that's a way of directly linking our product to uh, to consumers actually knowing whose wheat is in your bread if you will and because until like what happens currently with your with your wheat um, your farm organically does it go into the organic commodity system how does it work um, from from your in your part of the world what, who are your buyers and where does it go um, after it leaves your farm well, the organic market uh, is uh, here in Canada, a small market. Uh, unfortunately, we haven't been as uh, as uh, successful as many European countries in uh, in uh, growing the organic market, although here also as elsewhere, it is a growing market. Um, so most of our wheat is, uh, is bought by organic uh, uh, grain brokers who ship it then uh, some of it goes to the United States, some to Europe and elsewhere in the world. Um, it's, it's, as I said, not at nearly as dominant a market as conventional uh, grain markets. And um, it is also an export market for us because our consumer base here in Canada isn't quite big enough. Although, as I said, it is growing. We've been certified organic on this farm for more than two decades completely. So uh, we're very committed to changing the way food is grown and, and uh, trying to make it both healthier for the environment and healthier for people. And uh, as I said, we're, we're pretty committed to trying to shorten the food chain and get people back in touch with their breakfast, if you will. Which is a good place to, to start. And would you say in your area, um, are you the exception with your certified organic farm? Are there others? Has that changed over the last decades? What, what would you say the, the direction is of your neighbors or your neighbor's neighbors? Uh, we are very much the exception still, I'm afraid. Uh, but <clears throat> our neighbors are not, uh, not hostile to it. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of interest in, in organics. 
Um, part of it is economic interest. Uh, the inputs, chemical inputs for conventional chemical farming continue to rise in price. And, uh, and the debt loads of farmers are higher and higher. So uh, if you're talking economics, uh, at least on our little farm, uh, we, when we switch to organics, uh, we have done better economically because our costs are much lower. In terms of the bigger picture, though, no. Conventional chemical farming and that corporate sector that drives it and the kind of ideology of productivism, as we call it, um, always trying to get more and more from the land, more bushels per acre, if you will, um, that model is continues to be so dominant that uh, it's the overwhelming number of, of farmers that continue to work within that model. And, and what led you, because by all means, it's not a small farm. I mean, maybe in the current context in Canada, it is. But what led you to, to start working on the smallholder farmer, the small farm um, activism war? Because um, it's a, quite a step from, from where you farm on, on multiple thousands of acres to smallholder farmers. What, what piqued your interest there? What led you to, uh, to go deep on that topic? Well, you know, I've always understood that um, uh, food is everybody's business and, uh, and we should all have a say in it. And particularly the people who grow food should have uh, a very big voice in how the food systems are organized. And uh, we should not cede that voice. I've always been, uh, when we started farming, we've always been members of the National Farmers Union here in Canada, which is a small scale family farmer organization very committed to protecting the role of small-scale farmers uh, in, in food systems. And um, that's where I'm located. But this, I don't consider this just to be self-pleading. I, I think it's actually very important for the health, ecological and economic health, and certainly for the viability of small of communities, rural communities, to have small scale farmers, to have a whole range of diverse farming uh, farmers uh, producing our food. And I think um, actually, when I look back at what's happened to food systems, I think that remains a core value, not only, as I said, self-pleading, not only to protect small scale farmers, but also to protect our environments. And increasingly, uh, we're, we're challenged by what I call global warming and storming, uh, climate change, and all kinds of pollution and soil degradation. And I think a lot of those problems stem from a framework where we've erased or are continuing to displace and erase indigenous peoples and peasants and small scale farmers, people who have lived on and taken care of this land and these communities, in some cases for thousands of years in our context as as colonial settlers here in the West for some hundreds of years, but people who know this place, and uh, uh, this might sound romantic, but who love these places must take care of them. And so it isn't just that uh, it, it isn't just that it's, um, it's my place that I'm a small scale farmer. And that's why I advocate them. I advocate for small scale agriculture, peasant agriculture, indigenous food systems, because I think the future of the world depends on protecting those places and giving those people uh, the, the the primary voice in our food systems. And we're, we're going to get back to that. I'm just wondering how important or unusual is it that your son came back to the farm in, in your context of neighbors and neighbors of neighbors, etc. Because I, I've seen that um, a few times at, at events with a lot of farmers where, um, let's say, on the organic and, and the regenerative side, there seems to be an optimism or a, um, 
maybe the sample size is a bit wrong, but at, at least when you ask who, who has a, a next generation taking over the farm, a lot of hands go up. But if you ask in a conventional industrial extractive um, farming conference, very few hands go up. How, how is it in your context? And then we get back to this more, but I just didn't want to lose this, this thread. How unique is that? Yeah, no, you've just raised an important point. Um, in our context, and I think that's the European context too, and maybe much of the world, but certainly in our context, the farming population is aging. And so you have a lot of farmer farming families, farmers that are near nearing retirement or want to be retired. And it is almost impossible for a newcomer, a young farmer, to get access to land. And we'll get back to the land squeeze thing. But that's one of the key problems of the way the land uh, markets are organized and the way the food systems are, are organized, um, that young farmers actually have a very hard time, given how expensive land has become, get, gaining entry. And older farmers need to retire. Uh, uh, and that transition to generations is very troubling and very troubled because of the financialization of land. So in our context, we do have some neighbors where um, the next generation is taking over. And as I said, on our farm, we are lucky that that's also happening. But uh, the majority, in the majority of cases, that's actually not possible. And it's almost completely impossible for somebody who isn't inheriting land or inheriting a farm to get into farming. And that's a great pity because a lot of young people understand, and I think an increasing number and mm -hmm. podcasts like these should actually encourage that, an increasing number of young people understand that the food system and how we take care of land and rural communities and water systems here out in the country, what we eat and what we grow is in fact key, a key part of the, um, the climate and uh, biodiversity problems that we're facing, crisis, I would say. I don't think that's an exaggeration that we're facing in much of the world. So excluding the next generation from doing ecologically good uh, in in good food systems and uh, participating in them is actually a, a very grim thing in our current context and and how would you fix now fixing is not the right word how would you um what are opportunities there to turn that around i think it's one of the big crises we have access to land um probably private ownership in land in in general uh, I would know some people that that argue that that's one of the main uh, reasons or, or uh, the the excesses of of land speculation and prices is one of the main reasons we're in a lot of these these different messes, let's say. Um, but how how would we um, how would we tackle that? How would we look at land ownership and access? Because interestingly enough, just like you mentioned, there's a whole group, and it seems to be growing of people that want to take care of the land and in some cases or many cases maybe are able as well, they just cannot get on because they weren't lucky enough to were born on a farm. And and uh, there are of course more people that were not born on a farm than born at a farm. So statistically, that's uh, just a very, very difficult thing to overcome. Um, what, what are ways that through the report and other ways you've seen um, that that can tackle this this massive underlying issue of land speculation and land ownership? Yeah, you've just uh, poked your finger into a major wasp nest here, and let me just let me just say what I the the, the big picture stuff. I think you're completely right that um, the financialization, the 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 as the land report, uh, land squeeze report points out, the financialization of um, uh, agricultural land uh, globally. And the entry of speculative capital into that market, which has and and that uh, entry and has increased enormously uh, over the last two decades, that's actually made it almost impossible for uh, new entrants into farming, and and it's squeezing out peasant small scale agriculture everywhere in the world. Uh, I mean, in some places it's more intense than others. Uh, but uh, but everywhere in the world, there's that uh, there's that pressure 
on who owns the land, who gets to control the land. And in the report, we have this uh, name, this what is an alarming statistic, and that is that 1% of the largest farms in the world control 70% of the world's farmland. I mean, get your mind around that. 1% controls 70% of the farmland globally. And in our context in North America and in parts of Europe, particularly Eastern Europe, um, that uh, concentration of land ownership or control over land is, is uh, increasing and increasing rapidly. And that's the, 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 the underlying problem for young farmers entering or for small-scale farmers remaining is that there's such a tremendous pressure on, uh, on land and such a, a lack of access to land for them. But can I say something a little uh, uh, sort of bigger context about Absolutely. this? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. It has something to do with how we've uh, allowed the capitalist um, mindsets to dominate the way we think about ourselves, who we are, and where we are. And the view that somehow land is mainly or uh, um, principally meant to be exploited, uh, turned into cash, um, um, maximized in terms of, of profitability and productivity, that mindset, that view of who we are and where we are of our land is, uh, is a, a very pernicious and destructive view. I mean, land is not just about um, value per acre or bushels per acre. Um, it's also about... Uh, where we live, what we walk on, what we eat, our cultural identities. Uh, I mean, food and, and, and the way we grow food and how we prepare food and how we think about food is very key to who we are as people as civilizations, as communities. So in the bigger context, this sort of conflation of price with value is a really bad way of looking at ourselves, a really destructive way of looking at ourselves and, 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 and operating in the world because it pushes everybody to uh, maximizing production, maximizing profitability, and exploiting what's called natural resources, but we should stop talking about them as just resources, as if the land is and, and biodiversity is just something to be used and profited from, they, we are actually embedded in this web of life, as I would, as I say, in this ecological context, and we're part of it. And if we don't understand who we are there, uh, then we will, and that's what we're doing, we, we will misuse and abuse the places where we live and where we grow food and diminish ourselves and destroy the world around us. And that's what you're seeing. So it's also, if I could just say, I've been a little long-winded here, but if I could just say it's, it's a moral and, uh, and a philosophical problem, an ideology problem, if you will, as well as just a financial and ecological problem. The latter two are embedded in how we see ourselves and who we are in this place no uh, thank you for that and no need to apologize for um answering in a slightly longer way we have space and time to to do that and um, the reason why we do the podcast is because we we're going to give space and time and we've actually recorded a whole series on the regen or regenerative mindset needed or regenerative mind what does it mean how do we square that with the financial sector that absolutely isn't in many cases, but has resources that could be put to use and are not at the moment in most cases. How do we square the interest and the excitement there is around organic in many places, but also regenerative and, and the excitement of young people, but how do we yeah, get land out of the, 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 the red race, let's say, and, and not fall into the trap and at the same time um, deal with the urgency that, that we need to move um, pretty fast as we're destroying 
uh, the soil literally under our feet. So how would you specifically, there's some great examples in the report as well. And actually one of the other statistics, just to mention it, I think 1% of um, like 80% of the farmland in Colombia, just to name another example, is controlled by 1%, just out mm -hmm. of sheer shock. Um, there's some great examples of land reform in the report as well. Is this mostly going to be, I, I keep going back to the word fix, but I'm not sure if that's the right, going to be um, addressed, let's say, by reform and by land reform and policy? What, what do you see as directions, not of course, concrete policy uh, intervention, but like what, are, what, are, um, what are ways out of this, specifically on this land squeeze, um, ex specifically access to land for young people? What do you see as ways um, out of this, um, th these challenges? Well, as we say in the report, one of the big problems is the speculative, speculative capital in land markets. I mean, that's uh, that those are those are investors with deep pockets uh, that have no direct relationship to the land, but uh, but are uh, lined up to make money from it, and um, and and that's uh, that excludes young people and and small scale farmers who don't have those deep pockets uh, from access to that land. And that's what you're seeing. So getting speculative capital out of land markets is, is key, but there's also the governance issue. I mean, um, we're not going to solve this uh, this problem uh, one by one. It, it's it's a question of governance, and there used to be on the agenda land reform, land distribution in in progressive regimes. Uh, the the view that land should be redistributed, and those who are growing food should actually <clears throat> have control over and uh, and. Uh, uh, decision making over the food they grow and the way they treat the land, etc. But um, but as you as you move towards more distant investors whose main objective is to make money from the investment, uh, then you get you you get this huge gap between the value of the land and the price of the land. And the value, I would say, is not captured by the price. And uh, and government systems have to be uh, organized so that uh, you deliberately ensure that the people who are the small-scale farmers, the indigenous peoples in their territories, are allowed and encouraged to continue to live and take care of that land. I mean, the idea that somehow the people who in some cases for thousands of years have looked after forests and waterways and land are somehow now in the way. And that's part of what we do in the report. We critique the sort of green grabbing that these people are somehow in the way of taking care of land is, uh, is surely a preposterous proposal. So, uh, so we really have to change the governance systems, the re-evaluate what land is actually about and who we are here, change the governance systems, get speculative capital out of the, out of the markets and go come to a place where we, we understand just what needs, what, who and what should be taking care of land. And, and do you see a role for money, for investments in, in a different way, obviously, than, than speculation in this transition, also in the retirement transition and giving access to land, maybe new uh, ownership structures. Somehow we still probably have to buy the land, maybe in different forms or, or different valuations, not the speculative side, but how do we, how do we free the land from, let's say, this financial system? And is there a role for, for money in that? Or do you see a role for um, for money in there as a as a productive tool, obviously. Well, we're we're not going to unload capitalism in one fell swoop here. That's uh, that's not. I have on a magic the wand question later. If you give it magic power, what to change? But we'll get to that later. But let's say that doesn't happen. Yeah. Yeah. No. No. We're uh, so so uh, so at this moment. I think the limitations, the 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 regulations and the limitations. I mean, there are instruments. Uh, there are ways of financing land. There would should be ways of doing corporate and community based land uh, financing that uh, that. Uh, 
uh, would give you a different result. Um, if you had as part of the investment strategy, those other values incorporated that it would that environmental, ecological care, community, vibrancy, uh, uh, protection of waterways, and all of those were part of how land could be bought and what it could be used for. Those are governance issues. Then, as I said, there, there would be a way of financing, innovative financing for farmers to access land. That's another possibility, cooperative land ownership. There used to be, of course, in and still is in some countries, a sort of common ground policy where, for example, the ejidos in Mexico traditionally were community-owned, uh, controlled land spaces, and there used to be a lot of that. Here in Canada, we have public parks and public, uh, what we call crown land, which is government-owned uh, land, and a lot of that could be and should be uh, kept in the pu public domain and uh, organized and used in such a way that it serves the public interest. I mean, this is the thing that we need to talk about when we're talking about financial instruments. Um, there, We have, of course, governments that use a lot of money for public purposes. For for uh, to to ensure equality here in Canada, we have a publicly funded healthcare system, for example, equal access to good healthcare. Those are public funds for public purposes. Why can't we think about land in such a way too that public funds are garnered and used? for public purposes. I mean, this intensification of privatization, private profitability as being the only real use for land um, it, it is a real misdirection. And we're seeing how destructive that is. And you talked about, and we talked earlier about young par farmers, and I noted that a lot of farmers, or self-included, are seniors. So uh, one of the ways in which uh, it, we need to change systems is to ensure that um, retiring farmers don't have to sell the land in, to in order to secure their own retirement. That the land isn't, that the, the social contract includes um, um, that a new generation of, of uh, people can take over the land without impoverishing or disadvantaging those who have worked on the land uh, all their lives. So there's, you see, it's quite a complex nest of problems, but all of it hinges on us understanding that we're in this together and that those individual um, uh, solutions aren't actually adequate to the crisis we face. And you're talking here to a lifelong activist. So, of course, I believe that when we organize ourselves into social movements, and we uh, th that's our strength, and we can demand those changes and implement those kinds of changes. Uh, but it takes uh, a great deal of organization and energy and and political insight to be able to do that kind of work. And that's, I think, one of our missions here. We, we really need to get on with it rather than standing along the sidelines wondering why our world is careening into all the crisis that we're, co we're constantly facing now. That's no, my absolutely. little pitch and as an activist. No, no, I, I think you're, you're like we as society don't take this seriously at all. Like how many times do you hear somebody talk outside our circles about retiring age of farmers and there's no real path of transferring ownership or somehow liberating the land from the huge depth and the huge um, um, like speculative side, which is an immense issue. We never talk about it. And, and we, I think by going to cities and by distancing ourselves from the land, um, and our food system, we we lost connection with it, and we basically don't really uh, take it seriously. And that's coming back to to haunt us now. 
uh, quite badly with with the heat waves, the droughts, the fire, the floods, and uh, and of course an incredibly poor quality food in in many places. And we yeah, it's about time we take it seriously. So, what would be your message if you let's say we do an evening in the financial heart of Canada um, in a theater with with a lot of uh, people that are interested in this transition, but are also uh, managing money or in the financial system. And, and of course we inspire, we are on stage, we, we share a lot of examples, things like that. But if we had one thing that you would like to, one seed you would like to plant in their mind that they remember the next day when they get to work and they actually have to do something different. And what would that one seed be if you had to pick one? Oh my, you're asking me a very <laughs> difficult question because it's, as you see from my discourse, it's my, in my mind, never one single thing. It's a framework of things. But I would say that if you're just being sort of pragmatic and you're trying to engage people, my first line is always when I get up to speak to non farmers. And that's most of the time when we're, when we're in conversation because the majority of people are no longer farmers. Um, my first piece is always to say, look, what you're eating um, is, in fact, a function of how farming is going. So th anybody who eats should be interested, must be interested in the question of what's happening in the countryside. So that's a way of engaging people. If you're eating, if you're not intending to eat, this is of no interest to you. But if you're ever intending to eat again, then this question is a, a question on your plate also. Uh, and then I would say to investors, I would say, um, you know, let's be, even in your own framework, let's be pragmatic here. The destruction of ecosystems around you is not only morally and uh, socially pernicious, it's also in the long term financially unsustainable. And a few are making a lot of money, but uh, seeing the world flooding and burning around us and the loss, the, the absolutely huge loss of biodiversity um, at the moment might not be threatening your bank account, may in fact be enhancing your ba bank account, but it does threaten not only you, but future generations. And let's take the big perspective here and, and put money back in that um, smaller, much smaller place where it should be in our thinking and our planning and start to put all of those other things that are actually life-giving and that are actually key to us being real human beings in human societies, let's put those back at the center and see if we can't recenter public investment and public interest uh, over and take that over and give that priority over private profit and speculative capital. I mean, I, I can't imagine that I would be welcome in the circle of investors, but I just think we have to be more, uh, uh, just morally conscious and socially conscious when we're talking about money and how money is used and what money is doing in the world. It's, of course, part of how we exchange things and I mean, nobody is trying to destroy monetary systems, but what we're trying some, some to do—some people are, but yeah, no, not <laughs> you. Yeah. Well, but they, but but they need to be cornered and put. They're wild. They're rampaging through the world in a way that uh, that is hugely destructive and is causing enormous suffering for so many people, particularly rural people, peasants, indigenous peoples. So the, it just has to, that beast has to be cornered and corralled and put in its place. And does that what make would sense you do? to you? Absolutely. No, no. I think we, we, we have unleashed uh, a beast that we can barely or if not control at all. And it's eating, eating the planet alive, let's say. Um, but I do see more and more, I think the underlying, I heard somebody say the other week, like the only risk um, wealthy, let's say institutions or families cannot hedge against is societal risk. Like if 
if we collapse, everything goes down. Like you can have the biggest, I think Charles Eisenstein says this as well, like the, the protection against uh, societal breakdown is not a bigger wall and more bodyguards, it's more community. Um, and, and I think slowly, but very slowly, more people start to realize um, that, yeah, you, you cannot eat money, literally. And we're starting to get in a position where food security and sovereignty is actually under threat. And, and even the most cynical, smart investor and, and starts to see um, the, the value and really the monetary value simply of functioning ecosystems. Uh, we're not there yet at, at all, but I, I'm, I'm seeing yeah, people starting to not freak out, but see like if the food system fails, everything else fails. Like regardless of your interest in, in small farmers or not, like this, this is of everybody's um, concern very urgently, not in 10 years or 15 years. Um, how we put that into action is a whole different topic. That's where we've been busy with in on this podcast and, and many people we interview. So what would you do if magically you're in charge of a large investment portfolio, let's say a billion Canadian dollars. I'm not asking for exact amounts. I'm asking, what would you focus on? It had to be put to work, but could be extremely long-term. So there's no pressure of early uh, financial returns, et cetera. At some point it would be nice if it comes back, um, but it can be extremely long for long-term investments. What would you focus on? What would be the big buckets of your attention if you had pretty much unlimited resources? Oh my, you're asking a, a, a big question and I'll try <laughs> and purpose. give it. And not very big answer, but but uh, uh, let me just start by saying that um, no one fund billions of dollars or what or thousands, whatever whatever denomination you want to take, no one strategy is going to solve a problem. But if I had um, if I had uh, resources, it seems to me that what I would encourage most is. Um, social um, cohesion, which means that you're you're that I would uh, support and I would put a lot of energy into and money into supporting uh, indigenous women's small scale farmer peasant um, social organizations which, I had at the core have at the core their own sustainability and their own um the 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 t- taking care of the places and the the social context in which they live um there's a there's this this tremendous tendency um for um academics and intellectuals and and uh, government people to try and impose solutions on um, on people, and often, and that's I think part of our problem too with how we treat the 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 natural ecosystems around us. We're very prone as human beings to try and protect ourselves by controlling everything else, and our uh, our uh, tremendous success in doing that in biosystems has meant to a complete undermining and a destruction of biodiversity because control always wants to simplify and uh, and have power over. And in the world we live in, both the social and the ecological world, interrelationships and complexity and diversity are actually the key to resilience. And if we don't understand that, then we try to take um, billions of dollars and make something happen in some in some place where we probably don't understand the complexities, the interrelationship, the injustices, the yen for uh, access, all of those you know, inclusion, all of those very complex interrelated things. So if I had, uh, resources, I would put them into um, supporting and funding diversity and uh, sovereignty on on every scale, uh, particularly in rural areas with indigenous women, small scale farmers, the people who have lived and understood those 
uh, environments and have grown food there for, as I said, in some places, thousands of years. So it, it wouldn't be, a, oh, now we've got a technology here and a billion dollars will spread that around the world. That's the kind of solutions we've had a lot of. That's the whole industrial agriculture culture, modernization of agriculture that uh, we from uh, Western Europe and North America have tried to peddle into other places of the world, mostly for our uh, profitability and their destruction. So let's not continue to do that. <laughs> let's not continue to think about money in that way and investment in that way. Let's start, start to think about all of this and money as only one component of trying to aid and abet and ensure that public interest is uh, and, and equality and justice is fermenting in all of these places rather than trying to kill it off. And as a final question, which usually leads to other final questions, um, but if you had, so we were taking away uh, your your investment fund, but you do have a magic wand. And again, I absolutely realize the complexity of the issue and the one solution is never, uh, one single thing is never going to be a solution. But if you had to choose and you could change one thing, which could be anything, we've had answers of global consciousness, uh, better flavor, um, stop private land ownership in one fuel swoop. Like if you had the real magic power of of the movies and the books and the stories and the fairy tales uh, and you could change one thing so not three like in aladdin but only one um what would that be i would try to change the way people think about themselves in their environment i would try to reframe the thinking i think uh we're um we're and 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 global communication systems and global capital and so on and so forth encourages this. We've become sort of monocultural, not only in our fields but also in our minds. And I would try to uh, reinsert a whole range of diverse ways of seeing ourselves and valuing ourselves and living in the world. I mean, the interesting thing about social context is how complex it is, but we're constantly trying to simplify and uh, and control it in ways that uh, that as as you and I both know are, have been extremely destructive and aren't that interesting or more frightening than interesting let's go for interesting rather than frightening let's go for diversity rather than mono thinking and uh, and see what flourishes i mean i'm a gardener and also a farmer, as I said. And when you are gentle and tender and loving in your own context, it is always astonishing. In fact, I'm awestruck by how diverse and interesting and wonderful uh, our surroundings actually are. Not only the people, but the plants and, uh, and, 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 and the environment. And I think if we value and treasure that, if I had a wand, that's what I would say. I would say, let's come to the place where we are awestruck again by the ecological context we live in, rather than the place where we try to control, diminish and uh, and uh, simplify the world in which we live. It's such a perfect end to this conversation and such a big mindset shift as well, going from a farming food and actually living system of mostly trying to control and kill and keep something alive, barely, to where we realize we're part of nature, obviously, but still realizing that is a big step. And we're farming with nature, which it sounds always weird, but I have spoken to so many farmers that discovered this awe and discovered this, this letting go of control, which is extremely difficult, um, but extremely important. Having fun in farming and land management again, and, and not easy, none of this is easy, but having children come back to the farm, taking over and, and all of that, 
um, basically facilitating life on, on land and very different than getting out on your tractor or whatever tool you use to try to kill and control and, and which we might have done for quite a long time in history if you think that the transition to an agricultural society and it, it might need quite a bit of undoing so we might meet, need a few magic ones to 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 get rid not rid but to to go through the next transition let's say as as society so i want to thank you so much for coming on here in a very busy season uh, part of the season um and to to share your work your wisdom and of course what what keeps you busy what keeps you interested and what makes you uh, in awe of uh, of your surroundings thank you for having me Thank you so much for listening all the way to the end. For the show notes and links we discussed in this episode, check out our website, investinginregenerativeagriculture.com forward slash posts. If you liked this episode, why not share it with a friend or give us a rating on Apple Podcasts? That really helps. Thanks again and see you next time.